Hello, and welcome to A Very Political Narcissist Part 2. The Avery series looks at various public figures, famous individuals and infamous ones to analyse their behaviour under the Tudor scope. And rest assured, more will be coming, covering a variety of well-known people. So, if in the comments you're asking about certain individuals, watch this space. Anyway, when I first wrote about Boris Johnson and the array of material that supports what he is, that was back in July 2019, and plenty of it happened that supports that. My eye was caught, however, by an article in the Sunday Times newspaper, which is a review by Dominic, Dominic Sandbrook. Mr. Sandbrook has reviewed a new book, which is called Boris Johnson by Tom Bauer. And it is very worthwhile reading Mr. Sandbrook's article and providing my comment upon it for two reasons. First of all, it provides further evidence with regard to Mr. Johnson and his behaviour but also it demonstrates a common failing by society at large to fail to recognise what is actually going on. You ought to have considerable understanding with regard to having witnessed that to yourself. Think about how many occasions you have sought to explain the behaviour of the narcissist to somebody else only for people to not get it. How you have felt a frustration with regard to how people only really get it if they've been through it themselves. Perhaps the hours of time, all of the energy that you've wasted trying to explain to people, look, they did this and it means that. The way that they behave means this. And that you've explained how it appertains to narcissism only for people to not get it. You are not alone in that regard. Society as a whole fails to recognise narcissism. And this is why the Avery series is so important. It provides an opportunity to bridge the behaviour of the famous and link it to what it really is, narcissism. Of course, that is not to say that every famous and prominent individual is a narcissist, far from it. But many of the rich and powerful and famous are. And repeatedly, journalists, broadcasters, bloggers, commentators and the general public attribute the behaviour to something else and fail to, to see what it is. And therefore, the purpose of the Avery series is to highlight the behaviours for you to see them so that you can understand more about narcissism, realise how they're applicable, but also then, in certain instances, see how people describe the behaviours, often almost nailed on, but then always fall at the final hurdle, never using the N word. So, let's take a look at Mr. Sandbrook's article about the book by Tom Bauer about Boris Johnson. The article is headed, Boris Johnson by Tom Bauer. Review, he just wants to be loved. And there we are, from the off. He wants to be loved. The necessity of asserting control through admiration, love, appreciation and the drawing of fuel. Tom Bower's biography of Boris Johnson opens with exactly the kind of scene you expect. It is August 2019, and our hero has been Prime Minister for less than a month. To celebrate the birthday of his father, Stanley, he throws a party at Chequers. But the mood is dreadful. Boris's four children, with his estranged wife, Marina Wheeler, are no longer speaking to him and refuse to come. They, of all, of course, imposed no contact. They probably don't know what Mr Johnson is, but they have decided, casting their moral judgment on his repeated infidelity towards their mother, Marina Wheeler, to no longer speak to him. He's a shit, one of the Johnson clan remarks of the new Prime Minister. Hardly a comment of respect, is it? He's utterly selfish. He's destroyed the family. And this is just on the first page of the book by Mr Bauer. 
Those comments from somebody within the family demonstrate the sense of entitlement, the collateral consequences of the behaviour, and how the pursuit of the prime aims, fuel and control, character traits and residual benefits results in broken marriages, estranged children. But will he care? Of course not. There is no remorse. There is no guilt. There is no conscience. The article continues. Who is Boris Johnson really? This book's subtitle calls him The Gambler, the kind of swashbuckling nickname he might choose for himself. Grandiosity. Yet over 500 dense pages, Bauer paints a rather different picture. His Johnson is entertaining, charisma, egotistical, grandiosity, and dementedly priapic. Sex is big on the agenda, and as you know, sex is a mass weapon of seduction. Sandbrook writes, but also lonely, needy, uncertain, and most remarkably, deeply unhappy. Of course, Johnson is not. He is not equipped with unhappy. The neediness, that is a form of the assertion of control. Lonely, he might appear it, but he won't feel it. Even more than most politicians, he craves affection, i.e. fuel. One of the most striking observations about him, buried deep in Bower's mound of gossip, comes from his old rival Ken Livingstone. In 2012, their second mayoral consul for London had descended into personal acrimony. And afterwards, Johnson was desperate to make up. He was worried that I was angry with him, Livingstone calls. Actually, Johnson wasn't. What he was doing was Livingstone's behaviour towards him will have threatened Johnson's control. So, by contacting him and trying to ascertain that everything was okay, Johnson was actually manipulating him. Livingstone continues, this is a breathtaking weakness in a politician. He wants to be loved even by the people he is destroying. And of course, that demonstrates something of a blind spot, but also a blind spot from the commentator about Johnson. Because yes, it shows that he wants to be loved, but what it's really by the people that apparently he's destroying. But what's really going on is this. He is asserting control over them by saying, please still like me. And that shows a breathtaking arrogance and a lack of awareness with regard to how that might be viewed by if that were coming from a certain type of narcissist. But with Johnson, he knows entirely what he's doing, but he doesn't care. Indeed, the apparent lack of awareness is part of his carefully constructed behaviour. Sandbrook continues, where does this come from? Like most biographers, Bauer finds the answer in Johnson's chaotic upbringing. And this chaotic upbringing, combined with a genetic predisposition, and we will come to that genetic predisposition in a moment, demonstrates why Johnson is a narcissist. Born in 1964, he was the eldest child of the bohemian artist Charlotte Fawcett and Stanley, who worked for the World Bank. Charlotte is the book's great victim. Indeed, Johnson's mother was a victim of a narcissist. Stanley, its monster i.e. Stanley, is also a narcissist. And Johnson, being the offspring of Stanley Johnson, had the genetic predisposition towards that, allied with a chaotic upbringing, the lack of control environment, and lo, a narcissist is created. With regard to Stanley, Sandbrook writes, an unrepentant womanizer who bunks off every night to visit his lovers, sense of entitlement, lack of accountability, he treats his family with towering selfishness. No, you're selfish, he tells Charlotte, not wanting me to do what I want. Typical comment of a narcissist there, sense of entitlement, blame shifting, lack of accountability. Stanley refuses to let her have a car. Lack of emotional empathy, sense of entitlement. So every morning Charlotte walks the children two miles to the garage to catch a lift to school. Stanley apparently allows his wife one new dress a year, which he insists on choosing himself. Sense of entitlement, assertion of control. For page after page, in fact, Stanley treats her with abject cruelty. Boris, says Bauer, is the classic child of a battered wife, but fails to identify that even though that is the case, this is the breeding ground, or one of them for a narcissist.
Against this background, Sunbrook continues, Johnson's political personality comes into sharp relief. He is ruthlessly ambitious because Stanley forced his children to compete for attention, lack of control environment. He is also naturally clever. His prep school classics teacher thought him better and faster than anyone else I had taught. But he is lazy, sense of entitlement. His father told him that if he was working hard, he must never show it. Masquerading. He is a loner, because he is not attached to anybody, who prefers playing to the gallery to genuine intimacy, the narcissistic rejection of intimacy. And to avoid being hurt, i.e. wounded, he hides his true feelings behind what Bauer calls a perfect Woodhousian performance, the facade. Again, note how accurate these comments are with regard to the behaviour of a narcissist, but fail to be specific as to precisely what they are in the narcissistic behaviour and, of course, failing to identify that this is the behaviour of a narcissist. Much of the publicity for this book, Sandbrook continues, unsurprisingly has focused on Johnson's love life. There is no doubting his appeal. One source claims that when Johnson was editing The Spectator, Dominic Cummings, future wife Mary Wakefield, was besotted with him, the charm and magnetism of the narcissist, like a spaniel on heat. His youthful marriage to Allegra Mostyn Owen was a disaster. He arrived at the ceremony with no suit, left the marriage certificate in his borrowed trousers and lost his ring on honeymoon. No sense of accountability there whatsoever. And part of that bumbling facade already being cultivated. He has no accountability to the marriage and, of course, utilises this ruffled, supposedly uncaring appearance as, an, as something that enables him to deflect accountability. Again, as mentioned in the earlier article, you can picture him shrugging our shucks and inside he's laughing. His second wife, Marina, is the book's heroine, sane, saintly and long-suffering. But, of course, he destroys that relationship too. Not though he would care. As Petronella Wyatt, Helen McIntyre, Anna Fazakli and Jennifer Curry make their inevitable appearances, all mistresses and affair partners of Johnson, demonstrating the type of fuel matrix that he has and, again, the sense of entitlement, the lack of emotional empathy. Even here, though, the atmosphere is oddly depressing. You are the first woman friend I have ever had, he tells Wyatt. Again, that's just manipulation. Later, as Mayor of London, he tells Akuri they should run off together to open a Bulgarian ski centre. Funny or tragic? No, it's all part of that sense of entitlement and deciding that he will do whatever he wants to assert control. In Bauer's account, the real hinge of Johnson's career was his first mayoral campaign in 2008. Perhaps this is not surprising, since it was Bauer's wife, the former Evening Standard editor Veronica Wadley, now ennobled, who put him up to it. In the capital, Bauer suggests, his political performance was honed to perfection. His genius, he writes, was to persuade people to like him. Funny, tactless, ironic, posh, vague and genial, he did not refuse any demand for a selfie. A carefully crafted and calculated facade that enabled him to assert control over millions. So far, so predictable, continues Sandbrook. Then come two hints of things to come. As victory approaches, the Tory treasurer, Jonathan Marland, realises how much Johnson fears office. Not at all. He just doesn't care to be prepared. He will allow other people to do it, the reliance on others. Johnson has no team, no plan, and no idea how to manage a budget. Then he wins. At the victory party, he and Marina can barely look one another in the eye. And Stanley, the father, jostling for attention as always, i.e. asserting control. Every time Boris succeeds, a friend says, a little bit of Stanley dies. Of course, the success of Boris impacts upon the control of his narcissistic father. As this suggests, the author Bauer is an indefatigable bloodhound with a boundless appetite for gossip. His book's literary and intellectual qualities, however, are non-existence. Like his last biography, A Life of Jeremy Corbyn, also a narcissist incidentally, it is padded beyond endurance. Bauer calls Johnson's attitude to Europe clear and principled, which is counterintuitive to put it kindly. Indeed, 
The evidence supports an alternative view. Yet, at the same time, he accuses failing Foreign Office mandarins of malignancy, timidity, unimpressive intellect and limited education. The book ends, unsurprisingly, on a bleak note. The 2019 election seems to bring vindication, but then everything collapses. As Johnson lies in hospital with COVID-19, his sister, Rachel, has a furious row with Stanley about using the phone to alert Marina and the children. Selfish to the last, Stanley is afraid that his daughter will give him the virus. Yet again, a lack of accountability, a lack of emotional empathy from the father, the narcissist. The Prime Minister recovers, only to find himself a dithering Covid casualty, trapped in Downing Street with a crying baby, a girlfriend 24 years his junior, a looming second wave and an economy imploding by the hour. However, this will not be of concern because he will divest responsibility to everybody else, throw them under the bus and avoid the problems himself. Indeed, this snippet of a review of a book by this journalist goes on to provide numerous indicators as, in, as explained, further underpinning the fact that Johnson is a narcissist and why he is because of the upbringing that he had at the hands of Stanley Johnson. Also notice, for instance, how Stanley Johnson has often been pictured without a mask in a shop. He knows that he's the father of the Prime Minister. He knows that that will attract attention. Of course, that pleases him because it is fuel and the ability to assert control. He has no sense of obligation to avoid causing a bit of a stir or a problem for his son by putting a mask on. Oh no, not Stanley. Nobody tells him what to do. And moreover, he does not care for the impact that it has upon his son and his position as Prime Minister. It would certainly be very interesting to witness the interactions between Stanley Johnson and Boris Johnson, two narcissists colliding. And there we are. Further evidence of not only the behaviours of Johnson and his father, showing two narcissists at work, but also how, whilst identifying many of these behaviours, both the author of the book and the reviewer of the book fail to realise what is actually going on. And this is why my work and your dissemination and sharing of the same remains of such importance. Not only are you benefiting from this information to help you escape narcissists, spot them and evade them, but it is all part of a wider education that you need to provide so that in the future, articles such as that Call it for what it actually is. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.